All right, the hat is on, which means so are the unhinged takes. We have JJ Zacharyson joining us. Every Monday we bring on a guest. This is the first of the guests that I am not matching with fully. I just don't know if there's anyone on the planet that could have matched like what I have going on from head to toe right now. So I didn't even I didn't even want to like lay you out there for bait and and have you attempt your worst. Yeah, I mean, look, I I could not come close to matching what what you've got going on there. I, I told you before we started recording, like like if I would have had some leeway here, I could have maybe busted out some crazy hat that I could find somewhere deep in the closet. But I don't think I could have I don't think I could have matched that. Not even that. Not only that, but like the hat shirt combo. I mean, the shirt the shirt's fire too, man. Thank you. And I I don't like like the undershirt for it. Um, but I threw it on because it was so cold today. And then I was like, you know what? I don't, this summer I've, I've just accepted the fact that I'm just about to go a little like wild with style. Like I'm just going to really yeah. get in my bag and not give a fuck about what anybody says or thinks. And this is like the accumulation of that. Bro, you're, you're in your twenties. You're in your twenties. You, I'm not, you, I'm not, I'm 30 now. Are you 30 now? I turned 30 in August. Yeah. Oh, dang. Okay. Well, around that time is when you, when you're finding yourself and discovering yourself, it's around that. So like, now, well, I've, I think I have flip. found myself and this yes. is the result of that. It's unfortunately. Now. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. All right. All right. Enough clothing talk. Um, y'all know who JJ is. He is the host of the late round podcast. He has also started to release his own line of products, uh, one in which we are going to dive into pretty deeply today. That is a late round prospect guide. And uh, I, I think it's a cool trend that we're seeing with these individual creators and, and brands and stuff really diving into and owning the dynasty space and, and very relevant to like the rookie class coming in because as the NFL becomes more offense friendly, I think we're seeing a lot more uh, rookie players being like super, super relevant to fantasy football. So I guess before we start, JJ, why don't you um, give us like a little bit of a sneak peek into the late round prospect guide, uh, what people can expect from that, what what like the product was when you originally thought of it as an idea from ideation stage to like execution on the product, both from like a, you know, an analyst standpoint um, to also someone running their own business and just, you know, content creation kind of uh, angle. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was at Fandle for a really long time. I wasn't able to like really create long form, like stuff that I would really want to create. Um, you know, it, I just didn't have the time to do stuff like that. Whereas now, you know, being out on my own, I'm able to do stuff like that. And so, uh, you know, I have a little bit of a, a front end development and graphic design background. I worked with a buddy who owns his own small shop to really make it uh, come to life a little bit more from a branding perspective and stuff. And so like putting it all together too into this like comprehensive PDF was also a very fun it, it, each year is a fun thing for me to do. So like from a, from a content creation standpoint, not just from a written word and analysis uh, front, but also the design elements of things. I love that stuff. I mean, that's, that's what I did in my past life. So, you know, that's, that's really uh, fun for me to do, but the guide itself is really, it's just a PDF. So it's nothing fancy. Uh, but in it, it really dives into what my prospect models are all about. I have a wide receiver and a running back model. That's what this guide is featuring. I did finally build a, a tight end model this off season, but it's not quite there to be like published. I, I I'm, I'm very, very conservative when, when it comes to me putting stuff out there because people will dissect the living, you know, what out of anything that I put out there, which is cool. I like that. I like to have that high standard, but uh, you know, I, I also don't want to screw it up whenever I put, put those new thoughts out there. So I have this running back and wide receiver model. Uh, I profile every single running back and wide receiver that were in this year's or at this year's combine. Uh, and then I also just dig through like what goes into the model. I know that not everyone's going to be in love with that or care about that, but the transparency is really important to me. You know, I, I'm not an analyst that goes out there on social media and says, you got to draft this guy no matter what. You know, it's just not my approach. You know, I think about things in a much more probability driven way. And I think that when you see sort of what goes on under the hood with the the model and such, you can sort of see that and it, and it comes to life a little bit better and, and a little bit more. So uh, you get the the breakdowns of the models, you get the the profiles for every single dude. And then I also in there have my year two model, which is essentially looking at guys who already played a year in the NFL. So they're sophomores in the NFL. And uh, there's a model that shows how they're going to perform in year two and year three in the league. And so I do a bunch of profiles for that as well. And I break down that model too. So it's all a comprehensive PDF. It's like 130 plus pages. Um, you know, I did it all. I, you know, like I said, I have a template at this point because uh, you know, my buddy last year was able to, to help me put one together uh, from a design perspective. And, and we sort of worked on that, but now that's more of a turnkey thing. 
and, and I'm able to, to sort of work through it and just put it all together myself. Yeah, it's very cool. You sent it over to me early and then you know i told you as soon as i didn't see anthony richardson at the 101 i stopped reading but i i lied i, I went through the whole thing it's a very very cool product very useful product which we're going to put to use today because we'll be doing a four round super flex uh rookie mock draft jj is set up at the 105 i'm down at the 112 we filled the rest of the board with people from the discord so this will be uh in real time basically we're drafting 60 seconds on the clock we'll probably be taking some pauses throughout the draft just to talk about different things we're seeing within the draft different player evals things like that um if you want to go grab jj's guide we will first link it down below of course make sure you're following him all over social media twitter uh you know everywhere he is we'll have that link down below it's late round.com it's pretty much like the infrastructure he has for everything he's got going on the podcast he's got memberships with the patreon he's got his guys newsletter all that kind of stuff so before we dive in uh jj what uh what else are you excited about for the off season you know from you know where, what you're doing work-wise or any like big projects outside of the prospect guide or has that been consuming most of your time so far it's been consuming my time um you know and then i try to take some breaks some some mental breaks and stuff because uh it's just a lot i mean to just get all that done you know um and then uh, i get the draft guide which uh you know did really well last year and that's more of like a game theory slash here's who you might want to pick in redraft leagues type typical draft guide but you know, I say typical draft guy, but I think it's much more game theory driven and oriented than, than a lot of other guys that are out there that are probably a little bit more just like player specific and stuff, which is totally mm-hmm. fine. It's just not my total style. Um, so I'll be I'll be starting on that, you know, once the draft settles down a little bit and such. But, um, you know, with with the prospect guide, I'm working throughout the draft. And so uh, the day after the draft is over, that guide will be back in people's email inboxes with updated profiles and stuff for where these guys land. Because I know that people have their their drafts start on monday you know after the draft it's it's such a tough time of the year if you do make a a product like this we make something super similar where it's like the crunch time is crazy and it it reminds me of kind of like being in season where everything's such a quick turnaround and for like rookies you know you do so much work for 60 to 70 players whatever the case may be and then the nfl draft happens then you basically need to like reevaluate every single player because everyone has a rookie draft like the next day or you know at best case scenario you have a week to reevaluate all fucking 70 players it's a crazy time of the year yeah exactly exactly and so uh i'm just locked into my office you know for those four days just trying to get it out so people are able to to utilize that for their rookie drafts on on that monday and then you know just just cranking on the podcast the podcast really from you know from a business perspective is really just a great marketing driver for me um, and, and it's something that, you know, it's, it's my baby, you know, it's the most valuable thing I've got. And so, uh, that's something that I, that I continue to focus on a ton, uh, more studies will be coming out this off season. That's really what my focus, I love the off season. Cause I can just like really dive deep into this stuff. Whereas in season, you have no time to breathe to be able to do that kind of thing. Um, so I love the off season just for that kind of thing where I, I have this spreadsheet of, of ideas that I've had for years and I'm, I just kind of pick them off one by one to be able to do these different studies on sometimes they, come to fruition and are great. And sometimes I look at the data and I don't get anything from it and I just wasted a bunch of time, but uh, that's just kind of the nature of the business. Yeah, dude, the off season is, is so fun. Like sometimes I think of myself, I'm like, man, do I even like football anymore? Or do I just love <laughs> the off season? And do right. I, you know, you get to step back and be creative and like put all these things into place, whether they're, you know, two week studies or they're five month projects or something like that. It is, it's a really, really fun time of the year because it's such an opposite end of the spectrum relative to how crazy and how time constrained you are, you know, while the actual NFL season is going on. Yeah. And the crazy thing with with what I'm doing now, because I'm, I'm doing it all myself, like I don't have any full time employees with me or anything. And so like it's one of those things where, you know, when I'm doing the weekly stuff, you know, like a weekly transactions column or slash podcast and stuff like that you know, no one's, no one's like reading or listening to that stuff until it's published. Right. So I publish it and then I get the reaction from people and that's sort of a thrill, mm-hmm. but like the, the true thrill is when you put a freaking 135 page PDF together and no one really looks at it before you release it to the public. And then you get all these reactions and reviews and all that kind of stuff. And it's just really fun. I mean, it's just like, like when you're putting so much effort into this stuff and then, and you can only do that during the off season. And, you know, you're, you're able to see sort of the feedback on it after you put all that effort in. It's just, it's pretty rewarding. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a fun time of the year. So I try not to let it pass me by, but I know football will be, the draft will be here before we know it. And then training camp will be here. And then the football season will start. And then we'll be back to rookie mock draft season, you know, before we know it. So before we get to next year's rookie mock, let's do one for this year, 2023, Superflex, 12-teamer. Uh, we're going half PPR. 
We're going uh, regular tight end scoring settings. Everyone in the draft knows the deal. JJ, you got the draft board up? I got it up. All right, get it. Tommy Gabagool, the made man. He's up at the 101. We got 60 seconds on the clock. I feel like, you know, the most standard question to ask the 101, is there is there, is there there a way you're taking a quarterback over B. John Robinson? There's not a way, but I do think that I might be – like, like I'm taking Bijan, but I think that that I could make the argument for quarterback probably more than someone else would. Like, just in, like I, I'm higher on the quarterback gap or like the lack of gap between Bijan and those guys than most probably. You've just, monopolized just, the quarterback position. Any argument yeah. you make is exponential in the quarterback department. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's just it's just one of those things where where, you know, we know in Superflex how Superflex startups work, generally speaking. Oh, wow. All right. So Gibbs went 104 here. Yep. This is where I'm going to get your boy. I'm going to get I'm going to get Anthony Richardson there. For the for the record, Richardson like is my he's my QB3 in the class and I'm 104 later. I'm not super high on him. I just, you know, I just, it just felt like low hanging fruit to throw at you. Uh, okay. That, okay. That I was got the you. first name, you know. I got um, you. A rich though, so it, it seems like I, I feel like you can't really just like auto fade him. One hundred five and super flex seems uh, kind of like a nut draw right there. Yeah, I mean, like I think I have him at one hundred four. Uh, I have Stroud at as my QB one and, and mm-hmm. Bryce Young as my QB two. Um, I, I think it's I mean it's definitely different in single quarterback. Like single quarterback, I'm just gonna I'm gonna go nuts and just go for Anthony Richardson because the opportunity cost isn't nearly as as immense, you know, in, in a single quarterback league. Um, it just doesn't matter if you don't if you don't hit on that pick. You know, the opportunity cost here is obviously you wouldn't get Stroud. You wouldn't get young if you're taking them over them. You wouldn't get a Gibbs or a, or a JSN who, you know, I like, I personally like JSN over Gibbs, but yeah, I mean, I, I think Richardson at least has the crazy seal the you know, the could match hypothetically speaking, the Josh Allen type ceiling in fantasy, but obviously you know, the question mark is, is it going to be sustainable? Is he going to be able to actually do that? Yeah. I can't wait to see Anthony Richardson play out, you know, because yeah. the, the argument is just so it's kind of like nauseating. It's just like, he's so athletic. Like, of course he's got the upside. It's so hard to believe that he's a good actual passer as, a, yeah. as opposed to like an athletic thrower of the football. So I don't know. I'm, I'm excited to see how, how it plays out. I think we'll learn a lot from the situation. I'm, I'm with you though. I would take JSN over Jameer Gibbs in a one QB league. Uh, I think I saw your rankings beforehand. You had Richardson as a first round pick. And I know when I had Nate Liss on last week, he was all for Richardson at like the 106, 107. Uh-huh. And obviously the opportunity cost is not as immense in those types of leagues. But I mean, first round, there's definitely, uh, I mean, you're definitely still leaving some players on the board at that point, no? Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of it is that when I approach like my pre-draft rankings, like for instance, this is a good example. So like I published the prospect guide and a couple people came at me and they're like, I thought this was a good running back class. Why do you have so many wide receivers? Because I had like six wide receivers, the big mm-hmm. six, if you will, ranked above a, a lot of like the non Charbonnet, if you draw that line running backs. And, you know, the reason for that is not because I think that those running backs are going to end up being worse post-draft. It's that right now there's just such a cluster of running backs that could be day two could be day three. And so I'm just taking it easy and, and, and taking the easier path by saying, okay, you know, I don't necessarily like Jalen Hyatt more than some of these running backs uh, or anything, but I, I'm, I'm more comfortable pre-draft knowing that Jalen Hyatt's going to probably go late first, early second and going with that draft capital, as opposed to, you know, getting someone like Sean Tucker, let's say who could go in a day two. Sure. But what if he falls to day three, it's a very po- possible outcome. So you know, I, I sort of feel the same way with anti- with these quarterbacks where we feel pretty comfortable with where they might go. And so they're boosted up a little bit in those rankings pre-draft. But I think once we know landing spot and where this the draft capital is for those running backs and such, they'll get pushed down a little bit. Yeah, dude, it's it's doing these rookie mocks pre-NFL draft seems more difficult this year than any other year because I feel like we have less information this year than most years for sure. based on like the lack of athleticism and, the, and lack of people competing in the combine. So I'm sitting here at like 112 and I'm like, man, I don't I have no idea. Like I don't want to really take Josh Downs given the fact that he's, you know, 170 pounds, 175, like yeah. soaking wet at this point. But I can't just take running backs that I have no idea, you know, how they test out. Like Zach exactly. Evans, for all we know, could be running a four five seven at 202 pounds I'm like I don't want that at the 112 so I take Josh Downs I've taken Jalen Hyatt there at the 112 but that spot that corner spot there like 111 112 up to like 203 is it feels like such a black hole where I'm trying to either package package picks to like move up into the top six seven whatever top eight or move out of this year altogether 
move back in the rounds. It, I guess. All right. Well, let's start with like the Flowers versus Josh Downs. I guess debate here. Do you have when I when I watch them to play, I got more excited about Josh Downs from like a film standpoint. Yeah. But after the combine, I feel like it was a little bit hard to get super high on a dude who's 173 pounds. You have a you have a strong take on either of these guys because it feels like every wide receiver in this class is just uh, a small dude runs fast can separate and it's like we don't really know much else yeah look you know i i like josh downs uh, my model likes josh downs a lot because his production profile was, was pretty awesome uh yeah. he's like a spitting image of elijah moore in the model uh you know just just the exact same type of profile same size profile the difference is that when when elijah moore was coming out i think everyone kind of typecasted him as a slot guy and then he comes out rookie season and he only plays like 28 percent of his snaps from the slot as a rookie and that's why People were then, including myself, were like, wow, what if there, there might be something here with Elijah Moore entering year two because he thrived on the perimeter. Yeah. And then obviously last year happened, right? I don't know if Josh Downs is going to have the ability to play on the perimeter like that. Um, and so, you know, that's a that's somewhat of a problem from a fantasy perspective if you are, if you do end up being just a slot guy, like only a slot guy, because you're going to have two wide sets where you're not on the field. And that's important, right? Obviously, 11 personnel, he'll be out there. Um, and he's a talented guy. I mean, he's a very talented wide receiver, um, but that's sort of the problem with that overall type of profile. You know, you can end up being like a Cole Beasley type and that's yeah. not, that's just not what you want from a fantasy perspective. Whereas Zay flowers obviously has some size concerns too, although he looked pretty yoked, you know, whenever he, uh, bro, he looked yeah. unbelievable with Josh yeah. downs. It kind of feels like he's going to be one of those players where tough to see a fantasy upside come to fruition. You know, obviously always a small percentage chance that it happens, but if he goes to your real life NFL team, he's one of those players that could be, you could quickly become like your favorite player to watch. You know, like yeah. he, that that's how I feel about him. All, I mean, you got Jalen Hyatt down at 205, which I feel like is definitely not the norm in most rookie drafts. I feel like he's typically uh, bunched into that tier of Zay Flowers, uh, Josh Downs. I think there's a, uh, a really good chance he's the first wide receiver drafted out of those three guys. So I feel like you got to feel pretty good grabbing him at the 205 while the rest of uh, the discord goes crazy with these running backs. Yeah, no, hundred percent. You know, I, I I think Flowers like is is intriguing because even at that size, he only played thirty three percent of his snaps last year from the slot, mm -hmm. and so he played the perimeter a lot, and he can get vertical, right? And that's going to be something that teams definitely love. You know, Hyatt's a weird eval because analytically he doesn't look that bad uh, because of what he did last season. His first two seasons he did almost nothing, um, but from a production standpoint, um, and the, the the issue though is that a lot of the production that he did see last year was sort of manufactured. You know, he was a slot guy who got vertical and it's just this weird combination where, um, you know, you're not going to see that kind of, of coverage and, and play that kind of role at the NFL level. It's a little bit more gimmicky, right? And so I can understand not liking Hyatt as much as a Downs or a Flowers because I think those two guys have a little bit more projectable roles in, in the, at the NFL level. But at the same time, Hyatt has the at least tool set to be able to be one of those one of those guys who can who, that, that NFL teams love that are yeah. able to stretch the field and, and potentially play the perimeter. So I think he's one of those players where if the draft capital is there and if a team believes in him, then you can feel a little bit more confident. Yeah, it just kind of feels like uh, th there's anytime there are pl there's a player that comes around that we haven't seen like a really strong precedent for where it's like that same body type, that same player, you know, at least to a repeated volume. We're like, oh, we've seen this type of player succeed multiple times we start to stray away. Like we don't like mystery prospects. They always scare us a little bit. And that's kind of what Jalen Hyatt feels like to me. Uh, I took Izzy Abanacanda down at the 212. Mm -hmm. And I want to give a quick recap for the second round for anyone who listens via podcast. Michael Mayer went at 201, Devon A. Chain, Zach Evans, Tank Bigby, Jalen Hyatt, Hendon Hooker, Dalton Kincaid, Chase Brown at the 208, Kendra Miller, Sean Tucker, Tajay Spears. And then I took Izzy Abanacanda at 212. I don't even really love Izzy here. I just kind of wanted to talk about him because he was relevant based on his pro day yesterday and people are going crazy. And I just kind of want to talk about just pro days in general because we can get the numbers from the combine. And I feel good about that, right? We have every player goes to Indianapolis. Every player is on the same sleep schedule. They're, they're performing on the same field at the same time in the same atmosphere, same energy. So like the best players rise up and they are the ones with the best times and the best performance and the best testing. When you have pro day, it's like, you know, these dudes might be like sleeping in their own dorm, waking up with their fucking girlfriend, rolling out of bed, going to the field and being like, I feel at home. My homies are on the field with me. I'm running with them, catching passes from them. It's not the same as the combine. I also like do not trust 
any times that come out of pro days. Like I've developed a mistrust from all these like verified sources. I'm to the point where like, I, I don't know if I, uh, it's a terrible viewpoint about being like, I don't want to take players that just do stuff at their pro day, but people go wild at like every time someone posts the score of someone at the pro day, it's like, we have an unofficial time somewhere in between four, two and four, three, five. I'm like, okay, yeah. if you're going to give a 0.15 difference in what their 40 time could be, that means it could just as easily go the opposite way and probably be between four, three, five and four, five. Oh, I don't trust like these hand times realistically. What do you do? When we don't have combine numbers, are you just like sit tight, wait for some sort of official numbers to come out of the pro day? Because I know that I'm sure it like, factors into your calculations with your stuff. Yeah. So, you know, the thing. So, number one, with like wide receivers in particular, I really don't care uh, about okay. athleticism and, and their metrics and stuff. I mean, I do to some degree because I do think that that we'll see it reflected in draft capital. That's my my hypo hypothesis as to why like the model doesn't care about it is because draft capital captures that stuff pretty well. Like it's very rare to get a completely unathletic tight or wide receiver rather that goes in the first round or something like that. Um, so, you know, someone like Keishon Butte, like he's more than likely going to fall in the NFL draft because he not only was not very athletic at the combine, but then he didn't try to do anything on his pro day either yeah. to improve on some of those numbers. So um, I, I think that'll all be reflected with regard to, to running backs. Technically my model only looks at a speed score threshold of 90, which is pretty easy for guys to hit. Um, and so it's not that big of a deal, but I do look at comps and stuff like that. Um, and and I, I, I like to utilize comps to, so, sort of help me see if we've seen, you know, guys in history who have who have had a similar profile and do something. The thing with the Banacanda, I think that what we can do is just say he's fast because a lot of the data suggests yeah. that he's a fast running back. He was one of the top 10 players last year in breakaway plays in college football. Uh, you watch him and he's clearly fast. Um, and so, like, even if he ran a sub four, five instead of a sub four, four, it doesn't really change that much for me and my analysis of him because he's just that kind of running back. And to be honest with you, uh, one of his top comps in my model this year, uh, I think it is fitting given what he just did at his pro day is Isaiah Pacheco, where the, the size is there, the speed is there. You know, he doesn't necessarily have the best vision in the world, but he has that ability to break those big plays uh, and his receiving profile is good enough. It's not amazing, but it's good enough. Um, that's sort of what we saw out of Pacheco last year too. So I think what we could see, and, and uh, generally speaking, like a lot of times with these, uh, with, with this testing is these players, it's just all reflected in draft capital. You know, yep. like if a dude runs a four, seven, he's not going to get drafted high. And so, you know, we, we probably just, we probably double counted a lot. We, as in the fantasy community, when you could just kind of sit back and say, okay, well, where are these guys going to go? And then we can we can deal with things that way. Speaking of four, seven, uh, Kenny McIntosh ran a four, seven at his pro day, which was devastating after he ran like a four, six, three at his, at the fucking combine. Yeah. I don't know how you get slower after practicing for an extra month and being at your home field. Not the point. Um, you brought up a few things that I wanted to, um, that I wanted to kind of circle back on. I think a lot of it goes back to like common sense. Like obviously you're using a model, but what you said right there with Izzy is like, it's not really that big of a deal. If we know he's fast, you know, the extra half, a tenth of a second is not going to be an enormous factor when they're on the field. Um, this right. is he kind of fits into that mold of, like you said, Isaiah Pacheco, a uh, Tevin Coleman. You know, he's not going to create an insane amount by himself, but he has enough upper level traits where, as long as the products around him are, you know, above average or at least good, he'll be able to, you know, be an above average prospect and that's kind of just backed up by like you said the breakaway plays the in the range of the 40 yard dash kind of something like that and a lot of times we overlook things like you said with um you know not every super athletic running back ends up being a great you know player at the next level but every for the most part most great players regardless of the position end up right. being super athletic and right. when i had nate on i was asking him like hey what are some of the most like predictive you know factors that you have kind of accumulated over the years of collecting this data from college to the nfl and his thing was like the most predictive number that we have that we've ever found was literally just fantasy points per game in college. Yeah. Typically translate to fantasy points per game at the pros. And I'm like, it's such a simplistic approach yeah, to the game true. where we like to overanalyze things. But like you said, with draft capital, that plays itself out. Like if this guy's slow, not going to get the draft capital. If this guy wasn't good in college, he's not going to score a lot of points. And that translates into the NFL. Yeah. And I think people get like mad at analysts when they utilize draft capital. Like, like it's this like, like shameful thing for us to to look at draft capital and like, well, I think it's fair for people to get mad because analysts do like to lean back on shit just to be like, Oh, 
everybody said the same thing. Therefore, it was like it's like with breakout age or like any of these things where it's like some player just kind of checks most boxes. So they fall in love with them because if he doesn't hit, they know everybody else loves the same player. So yeah, like, I agree with that. Cool. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree with the groupthink aspect of things for sure. I mean, like, there's a huge problem within the dynasty world with that, where, where, especially, I mean, I, I did an episode of my podcast on taking metrics too far, where people will look at one metric and be, oh, he's not an early declare. No, I'm not drafting. There's I no way I'm that, drafting. Yeah. It's just, it's just, it's, it's obnoxious. But you know, I, I do think that at the end of the day, what is our goal? Our goal is to win in fantasy football. Our goal is to, uh, you know, have the best fantasy roster and build the best fantasy roster imaginable. And uh, when doing that, we should look at every input and 99.9% of, of maybe 99.5% of rookie drafts are happening after the NFL draft, right? Like for, for the average dynasty league, I mean, I'm in a couple yep. leagues that have them pre NFL draft and it is kind of fun to approach things that way, but there are still like avenues to find projected draft capital, like NFL mock draft database or something like that. And so these things are really, really predictive. Like draft capital is very, very predictive. And if you don't use that in your analysis at all, right? Like if you're just going about it and you're saying like, I like this guy. I mean, it's like Hakeem Butler years ago. I remember was a, was a really good example of this where yeah. people love Hakeem Butler pre-draft and that's totally fine. You like Hakeem Butler, but if you're not changing your priors after he goes day three, then you need to change your process because it matters. You know, like there's, there's, there's signal to that. And so uh, like my models utilize draft capital. I'm not like ashamed to say that they're, they're good at, projecting guys pre like my 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 non uh, you know if you remove draft capital my running back model uses draft capital a little bit heavier than the wide receiver one does but the wide receiver model is still more predictive than draft capital itself even before the draft happens it just becomes that much better whenever draft capital is inputted you know and so i'm just trying to win at the end of the day like I, i'm not I, i'm not sitting here trying to get a job in a front office i'm trying to help people win fantasy football league. but not enough people are trying to win out here man it's crazy right. people are trying to win trades they're trying to win like the ebbs and flows of Dynasty Twitter, um, it's it's a it's a wacky world we live in, uh, in in the Dynasty fantasy football landscape. We've wrapped up the draft completely. We've got four full rounds. Uh, you took uh, Tyler Kraft, tight end. I'm not even sure what school he goes to, to be honest with you. Where's he from? He's a South Dakota State guy. South Dakota State. Yeah, what do you know Tucker about Kraft. South Dakota State? Oh, Tucker Craft. I say Tucker yeah. Craft. But he so so I built this tight end model. And I, again, I haven't like I've been publishing it to like newsletter subscribers and stuff, but it hasn't been it's not like my prospect guide or anything. This tight end class is absurd. I know that people are saying that, but like in the context of what the model is saying and such, uh it, it's absurd. I mean, the two guys, like Michael Mayer is a 92nd percentile guy. Anyone above the 90th percentile is has a pretty good hit rate. And then anyone above the 80th percentile has a pretty good hit rate. And there are uh, seven guys with an 80th percentile or better score when historically this dates back to 2015. We've only seen like three or four of them per class be able to get in that bucket. And so uh, it's just a really, really good class overall. But Tucker Kraft is someone uh, who looked pretty good in the model. He had a really good best season yard per route run rate. Um, which is one of the big inputs uh, within this model. And then all of these guys are just athletic. I mean, they all have good speed scores. Uh, you should feel comfortable with that. He has good size, you know, he's 6'5", 254. So, you know, he's, he's someone that, you know, I'm not someone who really invests in tight end very heavily in round one and two. I did a, an episode of that this week, actually, where the appreciation and the value that you get from tight ends, rookie tight ends from year one to year two, is not nearly as significant as what you get from running back and wide receiver. And that's especially, even if you, uh, adjust for where these guys are getting drafted in rookie drafts. It still is a better, you have a better bet to hit a ceiling out of a second round running back, second round uh, wide receiver than you do tight end. Once you get into the third round, fourth round, definitely, especially in this class, I want to be targeting tight ends a little bit more. Yeah, I, I agree with that. The tight end position this year specifically is like one of the few position groups that I feel like has had hype for a long time. And I feel confident that the hype was correct on that. Everybody loves yeah. to be like, oh, uh, maybe this running back class is not that good, but it's like really deep. And it's like always just, wrong. They just can't admit to themselves that most of the guys they like are just not good. And it's right. the same with the wide receiver class this year. The running backs might be OK. We'll see what happens with the draft capital. But I'm, I, I've am i watched like almost every tight end in this class, at least any of them that are like top six, seven and, uh, you know, looked at the numbers and stuff. And they're all like very, very good across the board. I think even dudes like Sam Laporta, who I really like, went four or eight. I think in a lot of classes, he's like the tight end two or the tight end three in that range and that gets me excited where i'm if i'm in like a tight end premium league i this might be the year to stack up and say like hey you know in in two or three years i might be able to use multiple tight ends in my flex spots like a starting tight end and then a laporta a darnell washington uh 
a Zach Koontz maybe if he hits or something like that right. in the flex spot. This is the year to do that if you're weak at the tight end position. Um, yeah. I wanted to circle back onto uh, your model a little bit and just the way you draft in general. So you're inputting a lot of numbers, obviously, into your model, and it spits out these, you know, the prospect scores, it spits out projections or rankings, whatever you want to call it. And then when you are drafting personally, right, like, I mean, you're not, I'm assuming you're not drafting based off your score. You'll probably make rankings that yeah. take into account your personal feelings on things, you know, tiebreakers, right. if he's a small school player, whatever the case may be. Um, what, what are like, uh, what are the other decisions that go into your rankings? Like how much film do you watch and how much does that go into your rankings versus your model? And like, what are the tiebreakers when you're on the clock of deciding, you know, one player over the other? So I watch film from the perspective of like wanting to not sound like an idiot, you know, like wanting to just know what these guys are that. about yeah. and be able to talk about Izzy Abanacanda and say, I mean, I went to Pitt and I'm a Pitt alum, so it's very easy for me to talk about Izzy, but like, you know, players like that, just to be able to say like, okay, this is what he seems to do well but that's not the bread and butter for me and i'm not going to pretend it's the bread and butter for me you know i just do that as like a baseline okay i'm, I'm gonna sound rel i can i can at least try to sound relatively competent about these guys uh but then you know i plug these guys into my model i get a percentile score and i tell people all the time like you know part of the problem in publishing the prospect guide if there is a problem is that people will look at oh this guy's a 92nd percentile player and this guy's a 91st percentile player well we definitely have to like the 92nd percentile guy more no it's not that's not how it works at all this is a guide right this is something that that you should uh you know if there's a large gap like last year uh the model liked Jahan Dotson a lot more than it liked Sky Moore and and that was a a, a point in time where you know in rookie drafts people liked Sky Moore a lot more yeah. than Jahan Dotson why so I ended up getting on that yeah. And so, and so I ended up, yeah, and I liked Sky more. It wasn't like he was like horrible or anything, but um, mm. you know, it's just one of those things where uh, when you see gaps like that, then you can sort of take advantage of, of what the market is doing. I still try to get some exposure to like a Sky more because I have a lot of leagues that I'm playing in, but I have way more Jahan Dotson. Than, I only have one share of Sky more across all my dynasty leagues where I have a lot of Jahan yeah. Dotson because of where uh, he was being drafted. Right. So it's really just looking at uh, the market dynamics combined with my prospect model. And then I subjectively change things. Like if there's, there, there's going to be guys in the model that just, just objectively should not look as good as they look. Wandell Robinson last year objectively looked really, really good. A lot of that was because, uh, you know, he got higher draft capital than we expected. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, it's okay to be like, okay. Or, or like Deuce Vaughn this year, like Deuce Vaughn, like size is an input in, in, in the running back model. So like he does get bumped down, but like, you know, I can't be, I'm not ignorant to the fact that, that Deuce Vaughn is likely not going to be a workhorse at the NFL level. So you're, you're, you're weighing in this, this floor ceiling combo whenever you're making these rankings and such, which is not going to be captured in a single prospect score. So it's just stuff like that, that I'm sort of factoring in and, and making my rankings and then sort of loosely drafting off of those rankings and tiers. Yeah, dude. It's like, uh, you know, it's a guide. It's like it, you put an address into the GPS and sure it's going to tell you the fastest route to get there, but sometimes you want to take the scenic route. Sometimes right. you just want to sit in the car and listen to a new album that came out and you never know how you're feeling when you're on the clock. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but I still think you should take it and put salt on your food. And by that, I mean, go over to lateround.com and make sure you go grab the prospect guide. Uh, obviously, JJ has put a ton of work time he's put his life his livelihood into this thing um this is what he's working on fully you should absolutely go check that out again link will be down below uh jj i will leave you here i will leave the mic open to you uh if you have anything else that you'd like to say to the great people of of bdg no i mean i, I appreciate you having me uh you know uh definitely check out layround.com check out that prospect guide you know it's 14.99 you know i i try to make price points that are at least approachable for a lot of people um because i i i love this stuff like this is my passion uh and i want people to just kind of see a different side of fantasy and, and approaching uh the game in a different way so hopefully you know you're able to check it out i have amazing uh listeners and such that are like buying guides to give out to people who might not be able to afford them too which is amazing and, awesome. and great so I'll, I'll randomly have like giveaways and stuff like that too that's over on like twitter at late round qb or then on my podcast late round podcast all right follow the man subscribe to the man buy the man's products let's go uh make sure you hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video make sure you subscribe to our channel if you have any subscription buttons left to to press at this point we love y'all thank you for hanging out and we'll see you tomorrow